In this video, we're going to explore INMO 2014 problem 2. And the reason I want to discuss this problem is because the process of actually figuring it out, or at least one of the processes of going about doing this, mimics the processes that I actually see myself go through when I'm doing some mathematical research. So I find this to be a really cool problem to resemble some of the stuff that I do in the sense that the problem feels organic and not something that requires a bunch of clever tricks of some sort. Before starting, I do want to give a shout out to Michael Penn, who has a wonderful YouTube channel on math, and he especially has a lot of problems on floor functions. Here's a playlist where he actually talks about uh, problems with floor functions involved, if you want to see more after this video. So let's dive in into this INMO problem involving floors that has a really interesting and cool solution. Hey, welcome to today's video. I'm Prof. Omar. This channel is dedicated to math all the way up to the end of undergraduate for your journey through that entire time and to prepare you for the journey beyond. If this resonates with you, please subscribe to the channel. And if you're already a subscriber, thanks for coming back. Um, so today we're going to discuss INMO 2014 problem 2. And the problem asks to prove that for any positive integer, this quantity right here is always even. Okay, so we should talk about what this quantity even is. First of all, there's this function here. This function is called the floor function, and it's the greatest integer that's less than or equal to the number x. So for example, 4.3, the biggest integer less than this is 4. Whereas for 7.9, the greatest integer less than that is 7. So we're taking our real number and rounding it down. Okay, so let's explore this. And this is an organic way to explore problems, at least when I'm doing research. I have no idea what the behavior of this function is like. So let's compute several values of it and then see what we come up with. So I've written down this expression for different values of n between 3 and 6 inclusive. Um, and I wrote down the actual floor values underneath each of these things. Um, and so we notice we do have even sums. Here we have 6. Here we have 8 and 4, 12, etc. Okay, so what I want to do is I'm noticing as we go along, I've written these in sort of an array so you can see like all the numbers divided by 1, divided by 2, divided by 3, and their floors as we go along. Um, okay, so we notice in this first situation we have 3, 1, 1, 1, um, and then here we have like an increase in some of these values. The increase happens here, increase by one. We have an increase by one over here. We don't have an increase here. We do have an increase in this contribution because we don't divide by four over here. And then in this case, we have an increase that I'm gonna put in a box um, because it's an increase due with the, to the square root part and not the division part. Okay, so here we've increased by a total of four. Okay, so here we have an increase here. We don't have an increase here or here or here. And we do have an increase here, so we've increased by two. And each of these increases is by one. And then here, we have an increase here and one here and one here. Uh, and these all stay the same. And we have this increase right over here because we don't have a division by six over here. And then that stays there. Now notice something about the places where we have increases. All the numbers are involved are divisors of the numerator, right? So here we have the divisors five and one. Here we have the divisors of six. Here we have the divisors of four, ignoring the square root part. So it seems like we have an increase here. Every single time we have a divisor of the next number in the next row. So to make that idea concrete, what we mean is, the floor of n over k equals the floor of n plus 1 over k if k does not divide n plus 1. So if k is not a factor of n plus 1. And if k is a factor of n plus 1, it increases by 1. This is the floor of n over k plus 1 if k divides n plus 1. So this is something that we think is happening, and we need to actually establish that. The next thing to notice is that we have the square root contribution, 
and the floor of the square root of a number will increase only when it is a perfect square, right? So since we've worded things in terms of m plus one here, I'll say we have an increase at the square root of m plus one if and only if m plus one is a perfect square. Okay, so let's keep all of that in mind and then think about what that implies about the situation. So what it implies is we can predict the increase as we go along from one number to the other. Right, the increase is going to be the number of divisors of the next number. And then plus 1 if that number happens to be a perfect square. So to word that concretely, let's erase some of this and actually write that down. What we're saying is if we created a function for this thing called this expression f of n, then what we're saying is that f of n plus 1 is f of n plus some factor. So we have to break this up into a case situation. It's going to be f of n plus uh, the number of divisors of m plus 1. Um, we know we want to prove this is even. I'll put that here. So the number of divisors of m plus 1. m plus 1, if m plus 1 is a perfect square, which I'll write as ps, and then otherwise is just f of n plus the number of divisors of m plus 1. Okay. So it seems like regardless of what n is, the change here is going to be an even number. Let's actually try to justify that. But first, we need to know why these statements here are actually true. So let's go through them. Let's first start with this statement right over here. Okay, so suppose n plus 1 does not divide k. That means that m plus 1 is between two multiples of k. Let's say k times m and k times the quantity m plus 1, which is also km plus k. Okay, so now what happens with the number n? If we subtract 1, we get n is between km minus 1 strictly and less than km plus k minus 1. Okay, so n then is at least km because it's strictly greater than this thing and it's less than the quantity km times m plus 1 as we saw before. So the floor of n over k is m as well. And the floor of n plus 1 over k was m to begin with. So their floors are indeed equal if k doesn't divide m plus 1. Okay, what happens if k divides m plus 1? If k divides m, pl m plus 1, we have m plus 1 is k times m, right? And so n is k times m minus 1, so strictly less than km, but is greater than or equal to the quantity km minus 1. And so when we divide it by k, we get that it's between, it's strictly less than m and greater than or equal to m minus 1. So its floor is actually m minus 1, which is exactly 1 less than this value right over here, m plus 1 over k, which is the floor of m plus 1 over k, because k is a factor of m plus 1. So indeed, this is the floor of n over k, this is the floor of m plus 1 over k, so the floor of m plus 1 over k is 1 more than the floor of n over k. All right, so that establishes that piece that we needed to be able to even make this recurrence argument. Um, the other piece is this floor of m plus 1 thing, or square root of m plus 1, right? And we see the only way that this is an integer is if m plus 1 is itself a perfect square. So it makes sense that we have the jumps at the perfect squares. Okay, great. So that establishes these two facts that we needed to get this recursion in the first place. So now let's analyze the recursive equation. So first of all, we notice that f of 1, 
the sort of the base case of this recurrence is the floor of one over one plus the floor of the square root of one, which is one plus one and so is two. Okay, so f of one is definitely even. Now we notice that f of m plus one minus f of n is dn plus one plus one if m plus one is a perfect square and it's d of n otherwise. Okay, so if we can prove that these quantities are always even numbers, then the difference of any two consecutive expressions like this is going to be even, and since f of 1 is even, that forces inductively all of the f of n's to be even. All right, so let's investigate why this expression has to be even regardless of what n is. So let's write n down and get an explicit expression for the number of divisors of n. So first of all, n factors into a product of powers of different primes. So we'll write it like this, where each of these p sub k's is a prime factor of n, and all the a sub k's are the powers involved. So how do we actually list what the factors of n are? Any factor of n is going to be p1 to some power between 0 and a1. And then some factor is going to have a power of p1, p2 involved with an exponent between 0 and a2. So there's 1 plus a1 choices for the exponent on p1, 1 plus a2 choices for the exponent on a2, etc. And they're all chosen independent of each other. So d of n is going to be 1 plus a1 times 1 plus a2 etc. all the way to 1 plus a sub k. All right. So let's see what happens when this thing is a perfect square and when it's not a perfect square. So this number n is a perfect square precisely when these exponents are all even numbers because then it's the square of a number. If these exponents are all even, then the constituents of this product are all odd. So that makes this expression odd. We actually should have an m plus 1 here because we're investigating m plus 1, and this should be m plus 1. Um, and so all of these constituents, because the ais are all even, all the constituents would be odd, and so this product is odd. So that would make this piece of the expression odd. So when we add 1, if it's a perfect square, this is even. Now, if this is not a perfect square, then one of these exponents has to be an odd number. Wherever it lies here, we're going to have its representation somewhere where this thing is odd, and then we add 1, we get an even number. So the product of all of these things will be even. So in this case, we also have that this thing is even here. And so no matter what, this difference is going to be an even number. And so by our cascading effect, because f of 1 is even itself, we get that f of n is even regardless of what n is. So an interesting problem, and again, the reason I like it is because you can play with data and look at what's changing at each step, make inferences, and then try to prove those inferences from what you see actually happening in the data. And that's something that's very reminiscent of my experience when I do mathematical research. I typically try to maybe code some things up or play with a lot of examples on paper and try to see what patterns I can recognize and then see where things are changing. And when I see things changing is where I'm able to maybe try to make some headway in understanding why. So I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, definitely click the like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already.